This series of tapes, Inflammation vs. Misformation, were recorded from classes given this year by Dr. Malachi Z. York, known to us as the Supreme Grandmaster Naya Malachi Zoduck L, our own Pharaoh, Amanubi Ruakata. And now, listen with an open mind and heart as our Grandmaster inflames you with only the truth. Allow your inner light to flow again and stomp out misformation with only the facts. And now, listen to the Supreme Grandmaster Naya Malachi Zoduck L. Well, the serpent in ancient Egypt was a symbol of power and authority. Uh, Moshe, as they call him, Moses, couldn't even leave Egypt without marching forth with a staff with a serpent on top of it. It later became a symbol of evil. A snake was not a symbol of evil in our culture. This was put together by those who grafted the Bible and turned the word Nakash into serpent when the word Nakash simply means whisperer. Just like the Muslims grafted the word Khanas from the word Nakash. And it would, be, it would have been too broad to say anybody that whispers is a devil. You follow? Especially in the large, where people whisper in each other's ear the secret word. That whispering transaction of the, of the master mason to the fellow crowd would be interpreted by some, criti some critics in the Christian belief as, if they understood the Bible, as a form of serpent activity because the serpent is supposed to have a hiss. You know, so, so what happened is they had to change it from whisperer to snake. About that, and then of course the, they support it with on his belly shall he go for the rest of his days, but they keep forgetting that that's an that's a, uh, admission that he was on, on his feet first. And they don't have on their records in their history a period of time when snakes were walking. Though they go back to Babylon Shinar, and they see on the wall a picture of a, a serpent with legs. But that period is called prehistory. So he only deals with history, those things that happen on this side of things. You know what I'm saying? So it was, it was considered a symbol of um, power and authority in ancient uh, Egypt. Right? Yeah, in the back. Should be hard to hear you, but I'm going to try. No, what, what I'm basically trying to say is everything that has been taught to us about us is negative. We can't just throw it away. We got to turn it to our uh, favor. In other words, the currents that are coming at us from six ether beings is negative energy. We shouldn't let it bounce off us into the universe. We should absorb it within inside of us, or as I simply say, right the wrong. Absorb it. The same thing applies, uh, applies to the aura, right? The human aura right now, because of the magnetic uh, imbalancement of the planet Earth, most people are walking around with negative currents. They've been encouraged to think negative. But they've been encouraged to think survival. They've been encouraged to think me, myself, and I. And that has bred this, this individualism that breaks you away from being a part of all. And that's negative. We've now, instead of sending that out into the universe, we've got to, as gods, absorb it. We've got to absorb the hate. Not just close the door on the hate. You know what I'm saying? We've got to absorb all the negative energy. Because we've got the power to do that. We can take, we can take an angry person and turn them nice. If I'm saying so we can take so we can take negative energy and absorb it within us and in ourselves and it still won't destroy us as long as we're standing there with God and not a mere mortal working off emotions. Got me? Yes, sister. 
I'm just having a problem. Every couple of days, since the switch Right. Uh, the Neturu, the Neturu, which is a, the ancient word for nature, you, Aeneas, the woman, is at work be- taking vengeance on her people. Like the Bible prophecies, and the Christians and the Jews have always said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And then if you think of how God, Yahweh, Elohim, Theos, Allah, how would he take vengeance? I'm saying he because that's a term they use. There's no he or she involved in nature. If I, but how would he or she take vengeance on mortals? Can anybody tell me? What would be the what would be the tools that the most high would use to affect mortals? Say that again? What you gotta do is open your book in the Christian Bible to Matthew 24. And they tell you about pestilence and plagues and diseases. They tell you about earthquakes. The Quran speaks about Zilzal, the shaking of the earth, the Ariat, the riding form of the horsemen. All through history, they keep saying that when this Most High Power decides to take vengeance on mortals, they tell you it's going to be through nature. And now that we're living in a day of that great and dreadful day of the Lord, everybody is asking the same question, what's going on? Well, what do you expect God to do? You expect God to do what Christians, after Jesus had already left, started teaching. See, they, what, they, what they were doing, they was creating the expectation philosophy. The expectation philosophy breeds people not getting up and making things happen right now. Islam teaches it, Judaism teaches it, and Christianity teaches it. Expectation philosophy is, I am expecting my Lord and Jesus Christ to come one day and solve all the problems. So meanwhile, you can kick me in the butt. I'll just turn... The other cheek. Muslims are saying, Elijah Nasr Allah, he was blessed. One day this help from Allah is going to come and that's going to be our victory. You see the expectation philosophy. Unrealistic. And now that the power of nature, of which all of them agree, had something to do with the creation of human beings, insofar as they'll say in Islam, well, man was created from mud. Correct? Or dust. That's earth. There's no place on the planet Earth where you can walk over and grab a handful of dirt, put it under a microscope, and not already find living bacteria. There's no place where you can find dust and put it under a microscope and not find living bacteria. So according to the Muslim world and the Christian world, when God created man from the dust of the ground or from the mud of the earth, God wasn't creating the life. God was creating the body. The life was already there in the dust and the mud. Because again, I say, there's no place on the planet where you can grab a handful of dirt and put it up under a mic and you won't find some type of living bacteria, even 6,000 years ago. Or better yet, 4,004, which is the Christian calendar's calculation. You know what I'm saying? Life was already there. Who put that there? Who created that form of life? What they're saying is shaped and formed, fashioned, and shape, man or mortal, of the dust or mud of the ground. But the life was already in it. That is working with nature. That nature had already provided life in the mud. Life is in the water. There's no water anywhere where you can put a scoop of water, take it and put it under a microscope. What will you see? You'll see life again. So if God took the dirt and the water, life and life, water, female, earth, man, that's why it's earth in the Bible called Adama, male, male and female created he, them, woman is the water, man is the earth, they got it backwards, put them together and formed mud. Two forms of life came together there, or two, two forms of matter that contain life were brought together for a greater purpose. You follow that? That was nature at work. They can say or imply that a God reached down and did it with his own hands if they feel like it. But then we'll get into he had hands. Well, no, he didn't have hands. Um, he just willed it into happening. He thought it, and the mud came together and started to shape it. So he had a preconception of what it would be shaped like. He has a mind. Um, 
No, see, God don't have to do that. See, God can just imagine things like kun, fire kun, thinking into existence they come. So he thinks them. So if he has to stop to think, there's a point when he's not thinking. If he had to think of the kind, the idea of creating a human being, he had to say, I'm going to let us make a man. So what was he thinking the day before that? <laughs> What was he thinking before he thought of creating man on behalf of mortals, I mean? Was he just there by himself? <laughs> if nobody else is there with you, what would you be thinking about? <laughs> if none of the things you understand or understand have been created yet, what would you reflect on? Could you have an active subconscious mind? You understand? Could you have an active subconscious mind? A subconscious mind is when you store information. Could you have an active subconscious mind to store information before information was formed? No. With me? What, is, what was this God doing? What was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing before he said, let us khalaq now al insanam in whatever? Because his Quran changes one minute's mud, then it's clay, then it's, then it's water, then it's from a um, single male and female, then it's from a cloud of whatever, 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 whatever prophet or poet wrote it. What was he thinking? Or what was he discussing with his wife the night before? Oh, I forgot. He doesn't have a wife. And he doesn't have any children. So he was sitting somewhere with these hands. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the hands. So he said to himself, let us. <laughs> created his own trinity. Let us, me, you, you, and me, make a man. In our image, in after our likeness, and he's going to shape some mud and then said, <laughs> and he blew into man. The breath of life, a man jumped up, a living soul. <laughs> How long? How long are we going to be believing this crap? When are you going to give this back to him and laugh and say, nice, come coming? <laughs> Just like you give, go back to the video store and you turn back in videos, it's time to turn back in the video called His Story. Yeah. Say it was a nice story. Thank you. I rented this video. I took it home. We watched it. It impressed me. I had moments in it where I believed it. It ended. The titles came up here. Because as the sisters asking me, what about all these tornadoes and things? Because their book of Revelations didn't tell them about that. Their book of Revelations tells them, wait for the craft to come. What about the people that are getting whipped up by nature right now before Jesus gets back? They go to church Sunday faithfully. But tornadoes don't pick Friday nights to come or Monday mornings. Tornadoes come. And they didn't prepare us for that. That's why you're asking. And it's happened all over the world. They're flooded in London. They're flooded in Germany. They're flooding the tornadoes. The volcano that's been dormant for thousands of years just erupted. They didn't prepare us for that. But have you noticed? That it has not really affected us, right. that we are where we're supposed to be, it wouldn't be bothering us, that we were, if we are in the wrong environment, at the wrong time, with the wrong people, I don't care whether it's a bus, truck, or plane. I was talking to a lady yesterday in the store, and I said, I don't know about all this flying, because you know, nine planes came down last week alone. She said, hell, a plane could have fell on somebody who was on the ground. I said, that's true. <laughs> that's that point you like, you don't have to be in a plane to die. What about the people that was on the ground when the plane came down? I said, that's the reality of it, that's true. So nature is doing this. You know why? Because it's our time. We should not be worried. Rain, most of y'all just kept sitting here. And when it started smelling like dog, neither. <laughs> Let me give him a drip. 
<laughs> it's our time. We work with nature. You with me? The Bible, the Quran, and all of those silly little books, that video we rented from them. Some 2,000 years ago, we, went, we got to went to the store and said, yo, can I get that video on uh, a white god who came to earth to save everybody? <laughs> we took that video home called a video called Our Lord Jesus Christ. We popped it into the, into the video recorder <laughs> of our heart. <laughs> and we sat there and we absorbed that crap and we've been waiting ever since. If you're a Christian, you're saying, you shouldn't be talking about us like that. I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about fools. And you're the fool. You wouldn't be sitting here. You came out here to find out what about that video, Jesus Christ. A whole bunch of Muslims popped in a video called Muhammad the Arabian Prophet is the answer to all the Negroes' problems. And they slide that video in their heart. A whole bunch of Hebrew Israelites in Israelite church took another one and said, we are the children of Israel and Yahweh is the answer to all the Negroes' problems. And they slid that video inside their chest. But the video ends. But time don't. Christianity is going out. Islam is failing. You with me? Judaism is gone. But time hasn't. And we have withstood all the crap. And now we're saying, okay, tell us the truth. The movie's over. Tonight's movie had a little drama, had some lust in it. Read the Bible. It's, it's got sex, it's got what? Violence, it's got got all the things a good movie has, any Steven Spielberg it does. But it's over. It doesn't apply to us no more. And now Mother Nature is showing everybody on the planet who's the boss. Yeah. The baddest military in the world. They couldn't do nothing about them tornadoes. They went through military bases flipping planes. Whether it's in China, and they think they're sophisticated, or Russia who thought they were sophisticated, or America who thought they had sophisticated military capabilities. Mother Nature goes through airports with tornadoes and flips over planes. Topples boats or, or massive ships. People are walking around the street now thinking they did not have to answer to any force other than themselves. When they got fed up with the God principle, they went into the self principle. But a force steps in and says, you may have given that video back on Jesus Christ, that video back on the Muhammad crap, but you still got to deal with the breath of life. You follow that? And, and what do they do? They remind you that you ain't as bad as you think you are. Because you worry. You worry your house might be next. And all the crosses and the crescents and all the Korans and the Bibles in them houses, churches be getting snatched up by nature. Nature don't come down the block and look at the Baptist or the Pentecostal church and say, well, I'm just going to leave that one alone. <laughs> Nature comes down the street, knocks up churches, bars, discos, health spas, hospitals. Nature doesn't respect crap. Nature only respects nature when it responds. And we're in a day and time where they're trying to suppress the reality that nature is at work and there is no more room for the crap, the tributes, or the silly religions of expectation. You know how long you've been waiting for Jesus? Everybody here has a relative, more than likely, that belongs to one of the mono, monos, god of ignorance and arrogance, if you look it up, one of the monos theos, the Greek pluralization for God theory, one of the monotheistic religions. Your grandmother or great grandmother believed that Jesus is going to come save her. I can remember hearing Herbert W. Armstrong on television, the plain truth, say, I know I'm going to live to see Christ return. He's dead. He didn't see his kind of Christ come, the kind of Christ Christianity is looking for. This is the expectation religion. You understand what I'm saying? I want you all to get that in your head so you can kick it back out there. You got to sitting around in the world of illusions. Muslims in mosques making salah, a victim to Allah. Every now and then somebody says, 
Still, they go to Mecca and die. Still, they plan a plan. Look at this. They plan a plan, and Jesus plans a plan, and Jesus is the best of planners. In so far as the plans that the Arabs had in New York last week to blow up some buildings <laughs> was abruptly right, blocked by Christians. Christian FBI ran in and shot two Muslims up and stopped them from doing their bombing in the name of Ismail Lahi. Is that right? Was that in the media? Are them niggas laying up in the hospital with bullet holes in them? Did the bombing stop? So instead of saying, they plan a plan, and Allah plans a plan, and Allah is the best of planets, you've got to change that around now. you got to say, we plan a plan, <laughs> and the FBI plan a plan, and the FBI was the best of planets. The FBI is more powerful than Allah. Because the Muslims did not succeed. And they were moving in the name of an all-powerful, unstoppable God. Could anybody have stopped that? No. Heck no. Would the old Sheikh be in jail doing life if he was following his God and his God was a good God and a powerful, all-knowing God? Would his butt be in jail doing life in America in a Christian jail? No. Would his, would his, his following be in jail? No. Hello? You know, not. Hello, wake up, Muslim. Your God is dead. Your God does not respond to you. You get no help. There's no Nasr Allah anymore. Now, if you pick up the Holy Quran and you start to read it, you may hear Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make you feel good. That he got help from Allah. When did it stop? You know what I'm saying? If you read the Islamic studies seal, histories of Islam, and trace it all out, you go back uh, 1400 years ago, and the Prophet Muhammad, according to their writings, got help from Allah against his enemies. Right? right. When did it stop? Why is Lebanon a parking lot now? <laughs> Lebanon was an Islamic country with some Christians in it. They fought the Christians, they lost. Islam is, I mean, Lebanon's a parking lot. When was the help? Mother Nasrullah. And Muhammad's answer was, in the Nasrullah, Karibi. Surely the help of Allah is near. Well, <laughs> it wasn't nowhere near Iraq when Saddam Hussein, who is a Muslim, was fighting against the Christian world, the U.S. of A. Where was Allah? And when Kuwait was getting ready to get attacked by Saddam, so the Muslims in Kuwait did not run into the mosque and fall. Allah, 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 I'm going somewhere. The Saudi Arabians, they didn't call on Allah. Who they call on? America. American troops is over there teaching them how to fight. I thought, I thought, I don't know, you know. I thought the Quran says when a Muslim is in distress in battle, Allah sends help from heaven. Angels are supposed to come down to help you. Unless you try to tell me it's American forces over there are angels. I don't understand why you Muslims are depending on American forces when you support eating one, by the way, let me add. Alcohol drinking one. Because Saudi Arabia has to put aside a certain neighborhood in Saudi Arabia just for the alcohol drinking, pork eating, naked dressing Americans over there. Where is the help? Hello. You mean you're saying? When did it stop? I'll tell you when it stopped. It stopped, stopped right after Ba'ad Rasulullah, right after the, the Prophet Muhammad. When they suppressed the family of Ali, when they suppressed his daughter Fatima, when they toppled pure Islam, and they introduced this crap that they're shoving down your throat today called Sunni and Shia and Ahmadi and all this other crap. When the pre Islam and its pristine purity was destroyed, before it was a religion, when it was still a way of life, when it was sent to, as a salvation to a backwards people 
in Arabia. You understand? When Muhammad was raised up amongst them to save them, speaking their tongue, receiving a book in their language for them to pull them on up into the future. That's when it was pure. But it stopped the moment the desert Arabs got involved. And when you look on television and you see word of D. Muhammad, I know you love him. I love him too. He's my brother, but he's confused. He got hit in the head with a rock call. I ain't got no sense. <laughs> he's always, and almost all of you Muslims out here, are always surrounding yourself with desert Arabs. I don't never see Word D. Muhammad. I don't never see Minister Louis Farrakhan around no Nigerian Muslims. Or no Muslims from Somali. Or no Muslims from Sudan. Or no Muslim from Ghana, or no Muslim from Senegal, or no Muslim from right? right. They're always around Pakistanians, Saudi Arabians, a whole bunch of what the Quran told them to watch out for. El Arab, desert Arab, they call them the most deceptive. And when we as Ansar refuse to sit down at the table with them and do what Farrakhan just did, you understand? I refuse to let them come to me and put a turban on me about my way of life. Say, so get out of my face, jump. <laughs> I had Islam before you knew what Islam was. Before Muhammad was born, we had Islam. You know what I'm saying? Now you're going to come and try to ask me, do I want to join the Islamic Council with a bunch of confused al Arab? A bunch of hadith following fools. And I as an answer, I said, hell no. You got to go. And Muslims, black skin, woolly head, picky head, buckwheat ass niggas with tug ears on, got mad at me. Because I don't want to kiss no Arab butt. Then I must not, he must not be a Muslim. He ain't want to hold ass all, he's a cold father. They all have been my private life. Because I don't want to fall in the train. Because I said, I'm hanging out with Sudan. Right. And I picked Sudan over Nigeria because I can overlay this crowd in Sudan. And everybody here from nappy hair to wavy hair to light skin to dark skin to long nose to wide nose to brown to black to beige colored skin would fit in Sudan without any racial problem. Right. Unfortunately, if you went to Nigeria, some of y'all, they'd be saying, you look, you look Nigerian. Others, they'll be saying, what are you? <laughs> but almost most of y'all got mistaken as a Sudanese, as an answer. People say, are you Sudanese? Tells you where you had roots. And I didn't say roots, I said roots. <laughs> <laughs> so, when did they lose the power? They, lose, they lost the power when they suppressed us. When they caused Fatima her life. When they sought out and killed Hassan and Hussein, the sons of Ali and Fatima and they killed the Prophet's family. That's when they lost it. And the fools that are in Islam now are demons. When did Christianity lose its power? When Paul went and followed Jesus' disciples. You with me? When he fabricated his own doctrine. When Paul was self-acclaimed disciple while walking on a roadside by himself, said, I had a vision. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, but he proceeded to call himself Paul. You tell me that God, the Son of God, talk to me, the Son of God in flesh calls you Saul, but you call yourself Paul? If God called me Banana Head, my new name would become Banana Head, and I'd be proud of it. But Paul said he met Jesus on the roadside. So it could not be confirmed by the special disciples of Jesus, only by a handful of people who wanted to listen to Paul. You understand? They lied on Jesus. Where did it go back? When the Romans, equivalent to El Arab, the desert Arabs, got into that religion, which was not Christianity, there's no such word as Christianity, Jesus never heard the word before in his life. Christians are being taught in church to call on 
upon somebody who would not respond. The boy's name was Yeshua. Yeshua Bar El. You with me? And that L is on the end of Gabriel, making him a more. <laughs> he would have never known who you was talking about. So that's where that died. So now, these videos you sell us are rewritten stories that I'm supposed to accept on what you call faith and live in a world of expectation until I die. Jesus is coming. My grandmother said Jesus is coming. My great-grandmother said Jesus is coming. And on the other side of my family, there were Muslims, and they were saying the same thing about the Mahdi and the Messiah. The Messiah, he's coming. Generations passed, and he did not come. Believe you me, there's fools in church right now saying, today on Sunday, Jesus is coming. They still believe it. Jesus said to in St. John's, you see me in a little while. We're 2,000 years away. Jesus' concept of a little while in most people is real different. <laughs> Muhammad said, surely the help is near. In the Nasrullahi Qariban, surely the help is near. Muhammad said that 1,400 years ago. Muslims are still getting beat up. Starving. Christians are starving. They want to hide Jimmy Swagger. Now you ain't hiding Jimmy, Jimmy Swagger. Pull Jimmy Swagger about up there so we can talk about him. Yeah. Jimmy Swagger had a whole population of us believing that he was right. Jimmy Swagger had his hand in somebody's pocket swagging the stuff out. <laughs> he got caught in a hotel with some old girl. Now you want to hide that that's Christianity. Jim Baker, another one. You feel it with me? You want to hide that Jim Baker was all homosexual, stealing money from people in the name of the Lord. All I'm saying is, why should I trust you now? Why should I trust any more of you? You understand? Farrakhan changed a million man march into a million dollar march, sticking the money in his pocket. Why should I trust Farrakhan? I can't question him. I can't question your preacher without you getting mad at me. Let me ask your friend, your minister, some questions to see how he handles it. You want me to ask you a good question? You want something new? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it, huh? Yeah. Let's do it. This is a new one for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> ask the Christian that is you. I know you recognize that as him. Right? I know you recognize this one as Mizraim. Correct? Who was Ham in the Bible and who was Mizraim in the Bible? Talk to me. Huh? That's right. Sons of Noah, according to the Bible, there was a great flood and the whole world, except for Noah and his family, was destroyed, drowned. Is that correct? Everybody on the planet Earth was drowned in Noah's time. This is what your religion teaches you. You walking? All right. Now, Noah, as they say, became the father of Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. Three sons. Right? After the flood, there should be nobody on the planet now but Ham and his family. I want you to get that in your head now. Everything else is dead. Drowned. No more, there's no civilizations, nothing. Okay? This man, Noah's son, Ham, which the Egyptologists, Ham, which the Egyptologists who think they know what they're talking about in America are calling Kemet, or Chemet, or Chemi, or Chemistry. You with me? Yeah. It's just one of the sons of Noah. Right. And our last son, Mr. I am, who becomes known in, a, in their Bible as Egypt. Mitzrayim in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, you look at any strong concordance type of um, Egypt and you'll see the word Mitzrayim. And Mitzrayim is one of the sons of the sons of Noah. And nobody's on the planet before that. You with me? Then we go to Genesis chapter 10 and walk Genesis chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12 and you're going to find out that there were seven generations of people 
between Mitzrayim and Amerigo II. Tilla was the patriarch of their religion, they say, which Abraham didn't know nothing about Christianity or Islam. His name was Abraham. Tilla was the father of Abraham. Are you with me? Only seven people lived between Mitzrayim, who was a part of the family that landed on the ark on Mount Ararat over in Turkey. No plane, no train, no car, foot, camels and donkeys is the way they traveled back then. I lived there. You just believe it. They had to travel from Turkey all the way to a place that did not exist if the flood really took place and everybody who was on the planet was dead, right? So they went over to a place that didn't exist and a boy named Mitzrayim who was a descendant from him settled over there and it became known as Egypt. Which they say in the Bible, it's Mitzrayim or Muslims say must. You with me? Seven people. Look at yourself. Your mother. Your grandmother. Your great-grandmother. Your great-great-grandmother and your great-great-great-grandmother, seven people back. Go back from Tyra to Mitzrayim, which really turned out to be six people. Now, Abraham, the son of Tyra, travels eastward on a journey, the Bible says, with it, and goes into the land of Egypt. And on his way in there, he encountered a pharaoh with great power. Yeah. A great power, a pharaoh, was living in Egypt when Abraham got there, who wanted to take Abraham's wife. Wanted to take Abraham's wife. And Abraham gave him up because gave her up because he was a punk. Because he was a chump. That's the only reason why he gave his wife up, because he's a punk. You understand? I can leave it. Real is real. But let's get back to the facts. <laughs> So seven people from Mitzrayim, and Mitzrayim was the first there after the flood, and he set up the whole empire of all of Egypt and his 36 dynasties, built all the pyramids and the sphinx, all the obelisks, all the pylons and bowels and fell, and all the different clothes, the designs, the concepts that they do not find in Israel, they do not find in Noah's time, the whole thing of Egypt, chemistry, alchemy, he did all that in seven generations, before Abraham got there. And by the time Abraham got there, they had this massive big empire that was so powerful that a, a Hebrew prophet had to humble himself before those people. You get where I'm going? Yeah. There ain't no way in the hell <laughs> they could have built the great Egypt with seven families. No way possible. Somebody's lying. Either the Abraham story going down there is a lie, or there, is no, or there is no Egypt. Now I know there's an Egypt because I can go to Egypt and see Egypt. I can't go to Abraham and see Abraham. I can't go there. But I can go see Egypt and on the walls of Egypt I'll see you. You with me? In your Bible, your God acknowledges the greatness of Egypt. Because your God sends the greatest of you to Egypt for protection. He sent Jesus there. And said, Jesus, go down there in Egypt and stay there until Herod is dead. He sent the best of the human beings, according to you Christians, amongst us pagans for Satan. Abraham went down there because the land that was supposed to be flowing with milk and honey that his God told him would be an everlasting covenant in that land. The everlasting must have went void, and God must have lost control of the elements because a famine came into a land that was supposed to be an everlasting covenant and a land flow of milk and honey called the land of Canaan. And it got cut off. Read your Bible. And then their God tells them, go down to the pagans in Egypt, Abraham, because they have. You with me? Moses. The father, the literist, or the scholar, or the, the recorder of the records of the law, called the Torah, was born and reared in 
Egypt, educated until he was 40 years old in Egypt. Their God, who controls all things, put the man who was to write their scripture, not in a Hebrew environment, but in an Egyptian environment. So he can come out of the Egyptian book of the dead and write his Torah to guide his people. Why? Because if it's true that Mizraim was the son of Noah, then Mizraim was also an original Hebrew according to your doctrine, which is wrong, but there was no such thing as Hebrew yet. So when Abraham went to Egypt, he was not going to see a new people. He was going amongst his uncle's people. There was no new religion. The people of Noah forgot the religion. Obviously, Mitzrayim picked up and migrated and took all of the customs of Israel before it was called Israel, of the Hebrews, before it was called Hebrews, and set up the land of Mitzrayim. And the people who lived in Babylon, under the Babylonians, calling themselves Israelites, lost the law and lost the Ark of the Covenant, and lost their dress code. When you see a Muslim woman with a headpiece on, and you look at the Egyptian statues of a Nemuz, we call it, it's the same headpiece. You hear me? Somebody did something. When you jump down, way down to Christianity, and you speak about the resurrection of Christ, raising him from the dead, bringing him back to life, you go to Egypt and you'll find what? The breaking of the mouth ceremony performed on all of the pharaohs that were gods after they were dead. When the Orion star made a 70 day travel around, when it rose again on the horizon, the sun resurrects the hor Horus, Horu, Horizon, horoscope. The Greek word Horus for sun in the Bible. When that sun rose, then the Pharaoh was taken and put in his permit and lifted, and his mouth was open so that the light from that star could reanimate his body, and he was considered being transported from, from death back to life. This is in Egyptian writings, predating Christianity. So what it is, he's a human god that walks the earth, you with me? He dies. They have a massive ceremony that put him inside a sarcophagus, which is a permit or a tomb. And then they resurrect him back to life for eternity. That's what they promise you in Christianity. You understand? That was copied out of our books. The whole concept of the resurrection or the coming of God is no more than the horizon, the sun, Sunrises and sun sets. You use the word set for sunset, and it just happens to be the deity of night in Egypt, the brother of Osiris or Usir. It just happens to be sunset. You borrowed it from ancient Egypt. You would be? And when that sun, me, when that sun from over the horizon, you see the light of the sun travel across the water. With that, if you was there in the morning and you can watch the sun come up over the water, you see the light of the sun move right across the water. Right? The sun of God walked the water. You copied that from us. Joseph's flavorous piece Some say flavorous. He wrote plays based on our story and wrote it into his story. You with me? His story is based on life. Our story is based on darkness. So they made you think that the devil was in darkness and that God was in light. When in actuality, if God said, let there be light, then God had to have been in darkness to cut the light off. Right, right. So darkness had to be there first. I'm not talking about racist people. Don't start patting yourself on the back. 
I'm talking about darkness. I'm talking about some kids that got hurt. I'm talking about how when you go to your house tonight, you with me? And you get ready to go to sleep, and the television is playing or the record player playing, and someone's in the back eating and laughing and joking, and you go in the room, you say, could y'all do me a favor, Ann? Could y'all quiet down a little bit, because I'm about to go to And then I go in my room, and my room is full of my stuff, <laughs> surrounding me, colorful things, memorable things. I must do what? I must cut off the light to bring that place to a peaceful, blissful, tranquil environment. I must get back into the darkness before I can go to sleep. And maybe I can't sleep with the light on. You have to turn it off. Well, the devil, Belzebub as some call him, Zuhen, Shaitan, Hasatan, Satan, they, Diablo, they got all kind of names for him. Diabolus, Apollyon, whatever all the names they could figure up to call somebody who doesn't cooperate with them. <laughs> Has been ruling the day in chaos. And now the night is coming for a new sun cycle. You follow that? And everybody knows. If everybody can feel that something is happening in the world, right. all over the world, somebody up there saying, keep the planes out my sky. If I wanted y'all to fly, I would give y'all wings. <laughs> now, he's so compassionate and concerned, he doesn't kill everybody that goes up, but there's not a place on the planet where a plane has gone up where somebody didn't crash. But we so dumb, we bungee jump even after the cord pops. So people are still flying. Boats are sinking. So now, because that's not affecting you, the powers of the ancestors, the ancient ones, are now moving inland and knocking on your door. And houses are floating away. <laughs> not houses in ghettos only. Mansions are rolling down the hill. Rich people who thought they had it together. They're watching their house float away. Watching and watching everything that they thought was important in this world, all the mundane, all the material things, float down the road under the power of nature. You follow? Because those people that rule are unjust. They are unfair. They don't play fair. And they have put most people in a position where there's nothing you can do about it as an individual. You understand? You're caught or locked in a system where you click on a television and they program you with programs. You understand? You got some tapes or some samples already stored inside the tape recorder before you put the disc in. So forces of nature has to step in on the part of those that want to do right. And they'll start making you feel good. All the new age people. What does a new age mean? It means they're fed up with the old damn age. They're fed up with that crap. We're fed up with trusting our, our politicians. We're trusting our leaders and our preachers. We're fed up with that crap. All we want to hell to do is get along. Half of the white people didn't like what happened to Rodney King. And half of the black people like myself knew, knew OJ was guilty. But could we sit down, us that all had that kind of intelligence, and meet? No, because we don't control the media. Those who want to control our emotions control the media. And they wanted to make you think that all black people was for OJ killing those people. You follow that? And make us think that all white people was for those handful of cops beating up Rodney King. Yeah. And that's keeping things the way they want them. That's business. That's the devil at work. You hear me? But how long? How long? Nature is stepping in and kicking ass. Right. Nature is mopping this place up. Everybody knows to expect something. But they come out here and say to us, we hear that your leader teaches that y'all believe that a crap is going to come out the sky and save y'all. 
Do y'all? I got, I'm crazy for that. I opened the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and go, mm -hmm. and it says, there's going to be a ship coming out of the sky, and Jesus is in the ship. This ship has doors in it, floors in it, it has doors with people's names like it's a theater. All the disciples got their private room in this room, in this crystal city, with their name on the door, right in your Bible. It says it's coming down out of heaven, a crack. Nobody's running up there. Billy Graham and say, Billy O. Graham. <laughs> oh, Billy Graham. Or Reverend Price. Ain't that heck of a name for a preacher, Reverend Price? <laughs> that alone would frighten me. I know, I know when I had to wear Price, it got something to do with money. <laughs> but, oh, Reverend Price, do you believe in the Bible? Yes or no? I don't want no philosophy. I don't want no tefsir, no interpretation. I want to know, do you believe in the Bible, the Word of God, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation? Do you or don't you believe in the Bible? That's all I want to know. <laughs> you got the Bible up, you beat me with the Bible, I go to jail, you make me put my hand on the Bible on my way out. I get the Bible when I'm dying, you got a guy reading the Bible when my baby's born, you're trying to read the Bible. Hell, I've been beat up with the Bible so damn much, all I want to know is y'all believe in it. <laughs> truth is truth. You've been pushing it down my throat so many years, I forgot to ask you. <laughs> you understand? They got a church and a courtroom in God we trust. And the young boy, what's his name, who went crazy and blew up the FBI building. What's his name? Mac Bay. Young boy went crazy. You know the funniest thing that bothered me about that thing? For them to ask, is he crazy? After he killed 160 people, someone said, you think he's crazy? <laughs> <laughs> the fact that a bunch of psychiatrists, you know, Sigmund Freud boys, Sigmund Freudites, gathered in a room with degrees. You know what I'm saying? These guys had degrees. They went to school. They had gray suits and stuff. You know, they had cachet cases and hush puppies on. These niggas gathered in a room and said, You think it's crazy? Hell, a man blew up a building, killed women, children, rats, roaches, fowls, babies, everything. You think he might be crazy? You with me? Then they go into the courtroom under the sign in God we trust and human beings, people who say they believe in the Bible, were saying, burn him, burn him, kill the boy, 27 years old, kill him, I want him dead. One woman had the audacity to admit her cluelessness, how dumb she was. <laughs> On national television, anybody missed it. You know what she said? She said, I did not believe in the death penalty until he killed my loved one. Listen to what that meant. <laughs> I did not believe in the death penalty until he killed my loved one. So everybody else's children and babies that were killed by serial killers and coops, it was okay. But the moment the angel of death knocked upon your door, you get a whole new policy on vigilanteism. They turned the damn country into Vineyard, Vin <laughs> say the word for me, thank you. <laughs> and had everybody saying, kill the boy, kill the boy. Nobody said, cure the boy, cure the boy. Because if this boy went off because of what happened at Waco, you understand? Then some other boy is going to go off. And what they're going to do is they're going to study the mistakes he made, do the same thing without the mistakes, because hell, the boy was dumb. The boy was dumb. He's a nice kid, but he was dumb. He made mistakes. You don't blow up FBI building and drive a car that breaks down on the highway unless you're kind of dumb. <laughs> you can't be that bright. You blow up the FBI building, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and your car breaks down on the highway. <laughs> you made more money for the bombs than you did the car to get away from. That's like these hip hop with their shoes untied and their pants down running from the police. How dumb can you be? <laughs> but because of all of this, because the state the world is in, because there's nothing that no one, no one leader, no one church, no one person can stand up and do to stop it, everybody said, God help us. Allah help us. 
Yahweh help us. Adonai help us. Somebody help us. And nature steps in to help. The problem is you looking for nature to be your God. You've been taught through your Bible or your Quran. And that's crap. Nature is stepping in. You know what you find? In towns where white folks and black folks hated each other, they got to help each other prepare for the flood coming in. They all passing the sandbags together. When the houses are floating, they're sharing apartments with each other. Shelter, sharing food. If I see a, a white baby floating down the street because I'm black, I'm going to go like this. I'd be the devil. I'd become the devil immediately. You follow? Yes. I'm supposed to help. And anybody who don't help another human being, that is the devil. I don't care what color you call them. You understand what I mean? 